well, some of us are animal lovers, so we're going to care about uh, animals and we're going to love cute kittens and puppies and uh, be good to them. Um, other people, it's a pity, you know, and maybe we need laws to prevent them doing some cruel things. Uh, but there was no sense that this is, you know, just a general question about human relationships with non-human animals and that that relationship is fundamentally wrong rather than being a few bad people who inflict gratuitous cruelty on uh, horses or dogs or cats. Uh, so that was what was needed to change, I felt. When I became aware of the issue and started thinking about the way we treat animals, um, I thought what needs to change is to get away from this idea that this is an issue for animal lovers and rather to say this is a basic issue of ethics. Hello. Today I chat with Peter Singer, who is one of the world's top philosophers, and he helped kickstart the animal rights movement and also effective altruism. And he wrote this great book called Animal Liberation in 1975, and he just updated it 50 years later, kind of a huge, massive update, not just a forward, but like rewriting two-thirds of the book. And so we chat about that today, and we chat about kind of the state of the animal rights movement. And what that means is we chat about kind of four big topics. One is we talk a little bit about what it was like 50 years ago, what the historical context for the animal rights movement was, and its relationship to Vietnam and the civil rights movement and stuff like that. And then we chat about, you know, why he updated the book, you know, and what has changed in 50 years. And, you know, both on the hyper-capitalism side and how we treat animals, which, you know, Peter goes in and talks about some of these really rough conditions. Um, and then also a huge thing about climate. You know, 50 years ago, we didn't, you know, climate wasn't as big of a thing. But now, you know, uh, as Peter said, the meat industry has the same emissions as the whole transportation industry. So we chat about that as well. And then third, we chat about how to fix it. You know, and, and a big thing that Peter's excited by is, you know, cellular chicken, cellular dairy, and these kind of new science things that will get those cost curves down to kind of give people alternatives to meat that they still love. Um, but we really do need to get to net zero there. And then finally, we chat about philosophy. You know, Peter's a philosopher, and so we chat about uh, topics like AI sentience and whether, you know, he'll be part of some kind of robot rights movement. Um, so with that, uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe um, on your apps. Yeah, I'm enjoying all these and hope you're enjoying them and trying to just help you all uh, understand the future and, and, and make it a better place. So uh, thank you and enjoy this episode with Peter. Bye. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe that we can make a great earth by 2100, an earth that we're proud of. And we're here to work backwards from that good future. And so this podcast interviews experts to empower you, the listener, a curious and serious frontier person with both frameworks and agency to build that better future. And today I'm excited to chat with Peter Singer. Peter is a professor of bioethics with a background in philosophy. He's been instrumental to the effective altruist movement and global poverty alleviation and recently won the 2021 Berger and Pl Prize for Philosophy and Culture, which is kind of like a million dollar Nobel Prize for Philosophy. And he also helped start the animal rights movement with his book, Animal Liberation, in 1975. And it was just updated with two thirds new material under the title Animal Liberation Now. Peter, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thanks, Reese. It's a great pleasure to be talking with you. Yeah, excited to dive in. And it's, it's amazing to kind of look at something like Animal Liberation and, and, you know, 50 years ago and be like, oh, my God, to, you see these things that kickstart movements and whether it's something like um, an artificial intelligence paper in 2012 or in 1999 or whatever, or something like this book in, you know, 1975. It's amazing to see how much impact it's had and also to see like, hey, there's it's still very important today. Peter and I were just talking about that. Um, and so the goal for you and me and for the listeners to understand what this good future for animals might look like and also how to get there. And so before we kind of dive into the animal side more, I want to ask you, Peter, you know, Richard Dawkins has this great quote. Um, he says, hey, Peter Singer may be the most moral person on the planet. <laughs> and so how did you become like this? Why did you become moral? Why not just be an ignorant kind of do nothing like the rest of us? Well, that's a really good question. And I sometimes wonder how my life would have turned out if I had actually completed my law degree, which... I was doing combined with a philosophy degree because in Australia where I was at university, you can go into law and medicine straight out of high school. So I, 
I actually intended to just study law. And then I had an advisor who advises new students. And he said, oh, you did well in literature and history and um, so on. You might find law a little dry. Why don't you combine it with an arts degree? So I did. And I, although I'd studied no philosophy at high school, we didn't then, um, I did take philosophy. And I ended up finding the philosophy uh, a lot more interesting than the dry law. And I never finished the law degree, but I did go on to do graduate work in philosophy. And here I am. Now, had I become a lawyer, would I have been a, an ethical lawyer or would I have been a corrupt lawyer? You know, it's really hard to, to work that out. But fortunately, as I certainly now think it is, um, I did go on with ethics. And I think I became a moral person in the sense uh, because doing ethics, I thought, is this really just a theoretical enterprise? And, and at this time in the, uh, talking about the end of the 1960s and early 1970s, uh, a lot of moral philosophy um, in the English speaking world was just about the meanings of moral words. It was trying to understand what it means to say we ought to do something. Is it objective? Is it subjective? Uh, and uh, there was no connection with real life or with practical decisions that one might make about right or wrong. But this was also the period of the student movement of the 60s and, and students were demanding greater relevance and I was part of that student movement. And I thought, no, this is, this is not good. I don't really want to do philosophy if it's just analyzing the meanings of words. I do want it to have some connection with the great issues of the day, which are issues like the war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, so I started working in that area, even as a, well, as a graduate student rather than as an undergraduate. Um, and I think then, you know, you felt, well, if you're doing this and you're serious about it, you, you, you need to live up to it. It's not just a matter of talk. Uh, yeah. So I guess, cool. you know, that's, that's, that's the direction I moved in. I convinced myself that certain things uh, that we commonly do are actually not justified or things are wrong. Um, and I think that's what lies behind the Dawkins quote, that I had sort of pushed the boundaries a little bit further, uh, particularly in respect of what we do to animals, but also in respect to global poverty and, and what we're not doing to help people in global poverty. Yeah, I love that. I think two parts to that. One is like, that movement was so powerful at the time, late 60s, early 70s, just people being like, wait a second, we don't like necessarily like the status quo in Vietnam and the civil rights stuff. And so you were already doing philosophy, but you wanted to apply that kind of energetic activist energy within that world. So that makes a lot of sense. And then, as you said, I think you just like took the conclusions a bit further where you're like, hey, if there's this drowning child or, hey, we should actually think about animal rights or whatever. And so you kind of, instead of just being like, hey, we should be kind of good. You were like, no, 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 we can actually push push the bounds of what it means to be, to be good. Um, so, so tell me about, you know, if you imagine what it was like then, and, you know, I'm 32 now, about to be 32. Um, so, but, you know, early 70s, why, what was the cultural fabric like at the time when you wrote Animal Liberation? Did people care about animals or what was kind of going on? Yeah, basically people cared about cats and dogs and horses um, and the exotic wildlife. Certainly they cared about preserving tigers and panda bears. Uh but no, they didn't care about chickens or pigs or cows or uh, rats and mice, which are used in laboratories, for example. Um, so there wasn't really an animal movement. Uh, there was an anti-cruelty movement. Uh, so for uh, British countries, there was the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was the dominant organization. But it was a very conservative organization. Um, in England, in fact, at the beginning of the 70s, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals had fox hunters on its council. Um, they, it was, it, they were there to make sure that the RSPCA did not oppose having a pack of hounds chase a fox and tear it to pieces. Um, and and the, the RSPCA, you know, went along with that until well into the, sometime into the 70s, when a kind of more radical group actually took over um, and and started to oppose fox hunting. But it, it also, you know, the RSPCA at that time had not opposed factory farming, although it was already widespread uh, and didn't really... And what really... was it like, 
yeah, so people were kind of caring about kind of those traditional, like, oh, your little cat, your pets, and, you know, some the horses are cute, and, you know, um, some of the tigers or whatever. And then as you said, hey, wait, shouldn't we care about the chickens too? Were people, how did people respond to that? Yeah, well, um, at first it really was just the companion animals, and it was a very sentimental movement. Um, mm -hmm. People were proud to label themselves animal lovers, um, and there was there was no sense that we want to extend concern for animals to people who are not animal lovers. It was almost just an acceptance of, well, some of us are animal lovers, so we're going to care about uh, animals and we're going to love cute kittens and puppies and uh, be good to them. Um, other people, it's a pity, you know, and maybe we need laws to prevent them doing some cruel things. Uh, but there was no sense that this is, you know, just a general question about human relationships with non-human animals and that that relationship is fundamentally wrong rather than being a few bad people who inflict gratuitous cruelty on uh, horses or dogs or cats. Uh, so that was what was needed to change, I felt. When I became aware of the issue and started thinking about the way we treat animals, um, I thought what needs to change is to get away from this idea that this is an issue for animal lovers and rather to say, this is a basic issue of ethics in, in just the same way that, for example, the civil rights movement, which I'd been familiar with, of course, in the 60s, um, wasn't just an issue for people, and I won't use the word, but for people who loved um, African-Americans, you, you know what I'm, people are saying, what Southern, Southern white racists were saying of the, of the white people who came down to help the civil rights movement. Um, and it wasn't, you know, but that it clearly wasn't an issue. For, you didn't have to have any special affection for African-Americans. Um, you just had to see what was happening to them as a fundamental wrong, as it was. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to say, and what we humans in general are doing to animals is also a fundamental wrong. It's not just because, you know, animals are cute that we shouldn't, or some animals are cute, that we shouldn't do bad things to them. Uh, yeah, if, that's cool. If, if they can suffer, then that's enough reason for not inflicting suffering on them unnecessarily. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a cool way to think about. It. It's kind of a funny way to kind of pigeonhole people. You kind of straw them. You're like, oh, well, those are just the animal lovers or the people who are real civil rights people or the people who like care more about women's rights or you know African American rights or whatever. Like, those are the people who who like can care. But the rest of us, the re the re the relationship overall is not bad. But it's like, no, 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 no. These are fundamentally bad systems that we have here, and and pain is being caused. You know, women should have the right to vote, and and you know, and and African Americans should have the um you know, right to sit at the same tables and separate is not equal and, and, and all these. And it also, hey, and animals that, that are full relationship with animals, it's not some kind of special animal lover thing. No, it's just the whole system and the whole relationship is kind of messed up. Um, so, so tell me about, you know, as that it did have, it, it kind of kickstarted the, the animal rights movement um, in, in various ways. And, and we're in this situation now, which is better. I'm a vegetarian. I became a vegetarian whatever, 15 years ago, you know. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's the, the <laughs> that's how we know it's successful because I, a random person, became a vegetarian. Um, but how did you, you have this great quote where you say, um, you know, your disappointment with it, which is like, hey, all you have to do is walk around the corner to a McDonald's to see how successful I have been. So kind of how do you reflect on its impact? Do you see it as being successful or are you like, oh, man, McDonald's and stuff shows that's so unsuccessful? Well, clearly it, it hasn't achieved what I would have wished it to achieve. And that is that, uh, yeah, they could still be McDonald's, but they would be serving plant-based food. Um, so, uh, yeah, in that sense, you could see it's a failure. But um, as well as having, uh, in hindsight, somewhat naive hopes that this argument would just convince so many millions of people that uh, uh, factory farming at least would collapse. Um, as well as having those hopes, I also had this sense of, wow, this is a huge industry. It's a very powerful, rich industry. It can spend money on lobbyists and advertising to prevent change. Um, here am I, uh, one uh, young philosopher uh, writing a book. Um, how, is, how is that going to change anything? So um, it did change some things. It, uh, I think it did help to give rise to the modern animal rights movement. And that movement has changed uh, some things, not nearly enough. Um, not only that there's still McDonald's, but there's that at least looking at it globally, factory farming 
has increased because as countries like China became more prosperous, uh, people with more income wanted to spend more of it on meat. And to supply that, uh, China has set up enormous factory farms. There's like 26 story buildings that are just full on every floor with pigs who never, of course, get to leave the building except to be killed. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, in some senses, the problem is worse even than it was. Mm -hmm. And do you, I mean, it makes me think of, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Lawrence Lessig in the past where he started with um, a, a on the lawyer route and then he did the creative commons stuff and then as he did the creative commons and he tr was trying to f he was like oh this should work out or whatever and it was like oh no there's this whole industry behind all these things and it's all about you know copyright and 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 then so then he kind of double clicked on that and like then moved towards corruption and how kind of government works and stuff like that do you feel similarly around like moving towards i don't know like when you think about having an impact in the world and, and you, you put out this philosophical argument, and one of the reasons why it doesn't happen is just because there's this massive set of corporations and incentives at play that kind of stop it from achieving its impact. How do you, how do you think about the theory of change for actually achieving kind of a no animal pain world? Yeah, I think uh, Lawrence Lessig's view, which you uh, referred to, that somehow uh, corruption is, is the root of all the problems. Um, is perhaps a distinctively United States view um, because the United States political system, particularly federally, is more corrupt than other democracies in the world. And, you know, I've lived a lot of my life in Australia. I spent time in England. I've observed what's happened in the European Union. And I think it's, it's an interesting contrast that in the United Kingdom and the European Union particularly, improvements and reforms for animals have come through the conventional parliamentary electoral process and they have passed laws that compared to the 1975 edition of animal liberation have freed up hundreds of millions of animals to have more space to be able to stretch their limbs to be able to turn around um, all things that they could not do in 1975 i'm talking about uh, egg laying hens i'm talking about uh, the breeding sows who produce piglets that are fattened for market. And I'm talking about veal calves, particularly when I refer to those forms of confinement. Um, and th those particular forms of confinement are now, as I say, illegal across all 27 countries of the European Union and the United Kingdom. In the United States, those practices are only illegal in nine states. Eight of them have initiatives for citizens-initiated referendums. And that's what's driven the change in those states with the one exception. But, you know, California is the best example here. It's twice passed by substantial majorities um, in the over 60%, um, twice passed initiatives to give animals more space. Um, and incidentally, just uh, a week or two ago, the Supreme Court in one of its unusually good decisions, let me say, um, did knock back a appeal by the National Pork Producers Association to strike down California's law as far as um, they wanted them to allow imports of pig products from pigs and, and that, that were not reared in accordance with California standards. And the Supreme Court said, no, California has the right to prohibit those products, which is good. But get back to the larger point I was making. Um, those changes have not happened in the federal system um, and are not likely to happen, sadly, in the federal system in the near future. And of course, they haven't happened in the states where most of the factory farmed pigs and chickens um, and other animals are reared because um, those states either don't have initiatives for citizens initiated uh, referendums or, um, you know, because of the dominance of that industry, they probably wouldn't succeed. Uh, but I think that shows uh, particularly at the federal level, the power of money and lobbying to block legislation to protect uh, farmed animals, which I am absolutely sure the American public would favour by a majority if they could vote yes or no on that issue after being informed and seeing a video of the conditions in which farmed animals live. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's kind of like 
because you have a traditional parliamentary system where it's just like, yeah, you pass the thing, you say, hey, we're going to have cage free eggs or whatever it might be, and and that you have better um, spaces for them versus in the U.S. is kind of like a YOLO, you know, each you know, a more of a federal system, and people do do what they want, and um, only with the citizens' initiatives do these things actually get passed. And so, yeah, imagining kind of a a better reality in which these things can, in some ways, be be put down by more. Uh, yeah, in a less kind of corrupt system where the, the the people, the pork producers or whatever, have control over it. So, so let's kind of move on to talking about how you know we've had these fifty years from animal liberation through to today, animal liberation now, um, the new book. Tell me about like why did you update it? You know why and and, and what's in the update? I think a lot of people do updated versions, and there's only like a new forward or whatever. But like you, there's two thirds of the stuff is new. So tell us a little bit more about the impetus for updating it. Yeah, well, I must admit I did that with the new forward um, from 1990 until uh, this week, really, um, when the new edition is released. Um, that was the only change. I, I did revise the 1975 book in 1990. I updated it. But um, otherwise, um, the basic text was unchanged. And so that had become very dated, right? If you think 33 years back, um, I was describing experiments performed in the 1980s. What's the relevance of that today? Um, and also even factory farm conditions uh, changed quite a lot, although it was there. But in, in some respects, uh, as I say, some things got better, let's say, in, in California and, and some states. But um, in general, some, some things got worse, like uh, chickens raised for meat have been bred uh, more and more in intensively to grow faster. To the, the chickens that people buy in supermarkets are, are really babies. They're six or seven weeks old, um, and yet they're very large. And that's because they're bred to eat all the time and put on a lot of weight. But that means that their legs can barely support their weight. So um, experts who've looked at this said that for the last couple of weeks of their lives, these birds are in pain. They're in pain because they're immature leg bones can't really support their weight. And uh, what can happen is that the legs just collapse under them. And then if they're not somewhere near the sort of feeding stations that are scattered around the shed, these birds are all indoors, like 20,000 birds in a single shed. Um, if they're not near one of those feeding or watering stations uh, and their legs collapse, they can't move. Uh, and they are just going to starve or die of dehydration. There's nobody comes in and says, oh, here's a sick bird needing help. Not even, here's a sick bird, I'll put it out of its misery. Um, they just walk through and pick up the corpses. Uh, and, you know, so that's that's partly to keep labor costs very low, um, that they don't employ more people. But it's also because the individual chickens are worth so little that it's not really worth giving them any attention. Uh, and that's what uh, factory farming has done. Um, let me mention one more thing about the fact that these birds have been genetically bred to eat a lot and grow very fast. What about the parents? The parents of these birds, the so-called breeder birds, have the same genes, obviously. But if you let them eat as much as they want, like these ones, they would probably drop dead long before they reach sexual maturity. Um, and uh, if they didn't, they would be so fat that they wouldn't actually physically be able to mate. So um, the parents are actually kept half starved all of their lives. Um, a lot of people actually use what they call skip a day feeding. So they only feed them every second day. And, and the hungry birds bred to have such a huge appetite, look around for every little scrap of anything they can find to eat. Um, and if they don't find that, they drink lots of water and they can drink so much water that that becomes a problem. So then some of the poultry journals say, well, you have to withhold the water from them when they're doing that. So then they're both thirsty and hungry. Um, and, you know, there's just no thought for the well-being of these birds. Uh, it's all a matter of saying we, we want them to breed the birds that will eat a lot and be ready for market faster because there's more money in that. Yeah. What that makes me think about is, and if you think about the changes from you know, 1975 through today in the last 50 years, one of them has just been the whole system. It makes me think about um, uh, medical marijuana or like marijuana in the US where it's like, you know, I used to smoke weed, you know, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. And then they made it legal in Colorado, California, whatever. And then it's just like, and then capitalism got hold of it. And now they like, 
they make it so intense and the THC levels are like 30 or 40 percent it's like oh my god and then then and then they have all these other crazy ways to do it. it's just like this is too much you know and so it, it makes me think of this factory farms here where it's like in the 70s we were just at the beginning of starting just kind of these mass it, we, we had these mass industrialized processes but now we've optimized them even more even more to make it so that the um the the, the chickens that it everything's optimized for mass you know rate of growth make the chicken as big as possible who cares if its legs break and then and then uh, make it happen and then yeah and so tell me about i think it's and i think it's actually important that you're you're telling these stories about the conditions um in, in these places because it's a reminder for us of just how bad they are and how much like society pushes them to the side and says hey we don't really care about this we're just kind of optimizing for profit here um, do, do you have another, I'm thinking about pigs or, or cows or fish or anything else like that. Is there, is there another kind of story that comes to your mind around these, these bad conditions? For, oh, there, for are, there are many stories. Yes, unfortunately. Um, with pigs, the, the, the sows, um, the, the breeding, the sow and the boar have the same genetic problem, right? Because the pigs are bred to grow very fast and the sows are, um, are kept hungry. Um, you know, they're on limited rations and, they are still very closely confined in the United States. Um, as I said, in the European Union and the UK, they have to have enough room to turn around, which doesn't sound like a lot, right? You keep an animal and can't even turn around. Imagine somebody said, oh, yeah, I've got a dog here. You can see this dog. Uh, I've put the dog in a narrow stall. It's so narrow the dog can't turn around or even you know, walk more than half a step forward or backwards. That's a good way to keep a dog, don't you think? No, you don't think that's a good way to keep a dog. And it's not a good way to keep a pig either but uh sows are quite commonly kept in those conditions uh when you know they would be much better off if they could move around freely and socialize with with other animals um they're bred to eat a lot but again they're kept on limited rations because they you don't want to get them to be so obese that they can't uh, have the piglets and their entire life is just really a machine to produce piglets so um they're, they're made pregnant, sometimes by being put with a boar, sometimes with artificial insemination. Um, then they're kept in these uh, confined spaces, uh, possibly not able to turn around for, for many of them. Um, and then when they give birth, they're also confined. Um, now, if you have look at the natural conditions for pigs, they're a forest-dwelling animal. And when the sow is ready to give birth, she obviously senses this in some way, and she has an instinct to make a nest. She gathers leaves and twigs and provides a, a comfortable bedding area where she can lie down, and the piglets can be born, and then they can come to her and, and suckle at her teats. But um, you know, factory farms don't give them that space, and they certainly don't want leaves or even straw because that's an extra expense. So the sow has to lie down on bare concrete or sometimes a slatted floor so that you can more easily hose away the, the manure. Um, and she gives birth and the piglets will be allowed to suckle for a little while, maybe uh, three weeks, and then they'll be taken away from her. Although, you know, she's, they're mammals. She's very attached to her piglets as uh, any mammal uh, mother is attached to their offspring. Um, and uh, they're just taken away from her and uh, uh, she's put back with the boar or artificially inseminated and gets pregnant again and goes through the whole cycle again, uh, again and again. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's not a, a decent life for um, any animal and particularly animals as intelligent as pigs with uh, lots of things that they like to do and certainly lots of capacity for being bored. Um, it's really a, a miserable existence we're inflicting on them. Yeah. It makes me think about, you know, when you just, when you get that piece of, of pork in the, um, in the, 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 you know, grocery aisle and you think about all the stuff that needs to happen to make that occur and to make it be like, you know, three bucks or whatever, how cheap it is. And you think about the, um, yeah, everything must be so optimized. You know, there can't be very many, can't be very many laborers there. Um, they're, they're probably in bad conditions. And then also for the animals themselves, you have to have these machines, the machines to have babies really quickly and to um, make them grow fast, you know, and that those things are just hyper, hyper optimized for that, that reality. And then all of the negative side effects as a result. Let's, let's chat about, so I mean, we have this, um, 
thank you for painting that picture of just how rough, how bad it is. And, uh, you know, there's 70 billion, you know, factory farmed land animals per year. So that's that's like a massive, massive amount. Um, <laughs> tell us about the, the climate change side, too, because it's you know, that's a big difference, too, between your first edition and this edition. How, how do you think about the climate impact of, of animals? I think when I wrote the first edition, I wasn't really aware of climate change in the 1970s. Climate change emerged into public consciousness and certainly into my consciousness in the 1980s. Um, there's a brief mention in the 1990 edition, but um, still the contribution that meat in particular was making to climate change wasn't very clear or well understood. Uh, what we now know is that um, there is a really big impact from the meat industry it's it's comparable to the that from the entire transport sector all the cars and buses and airplanes ships and trains uh and um in particular it's it's methane that is a major cause of global warming uh, methane is a gas that is emitted um by ruminant animals by uh, cows and and sheep in particular and and that's a very powerful co contribution to climate change because um, methane is uh, over a century, it's 27 times as powerful as a comparable amount of carbon dioxide. And if you look at it over 20 years rather than a century, it's about 82 times as powerful. And I would argue that 20 years is the more appropriate time span, given that nobody really thinks we have much more than 20 years to get greenhouse gas emissions down to zero um, without producing really catastrophic climate change, much worse than we're seeing now. So so how do you get emissions down to zero in 20 years or so? You know, there are many things you can do, and obviously it's good to produce more uh, clean, renewable solar or wind energy to replace fossil fuels. But, but something that is really easy to do and doesn't require any new technologies um, or any uh, you know, battery storage or anything like that is just to reduce the number of cows in the world. Um, and if we all stop buying uh, products from cows, and that's both uh, beef and dairy products, uh, then very rapidly the number of cows in the world will drop. Uh, and that's something we can do right now. No new technology. Um, just say no to beef and dairy, and you'll be doing a significant thing in making it better make sorry in giving us a better chance of avoiding catastrophic climate change over the next 20 years or so yeah yeah it's amazing how much it, it makes me think too about when you see those graphs about transportation and agriculture being the same percent and it's funny because that we even call it agriculture it's like we should call it meat you know like <laughs> right it's it, mostly it, meat yeah that's it's right meat. It's, it's meat yeah. and it's mostly yeah. cows specifically yeah. it's like um <laughs> So, and, so and, and the, yeah, and, and actually one other thing that I'll mention is a, apart from the methane, the other contribution of the livestock industry and uh, again, particularly um, beef cattle in this case, is the clearing of forests, which of course releases carbon dioxide. Uh, and the primary cause of clearing the Amazon is the beef industry um, both in two ways. One is clearing land so that you can graze cattle and the grassland that replaces the forest. And secondly, you can grow crops, which are essentially feed crops for animals. So Brazil grows a lot of soy. Um, and I've had people say to me, by the way, when I say I'm a vegetarian and, you know, what do you eat? And I might mention tofu. Or they say, oh, but tofu comes from soy and the soy is responsible for clearing the Amazon. What these people don't realize is that 77% of the world's soy crop is fed to animals. It's only a small fraction that goes to tofu or tempeh or uh, soy milk, um, the majority of it, three, more than three quarters of it is getting fed to animals. And essentially it's being wasted because, you know, we are feeding a nutritious product to animals who are going to use most of the nutritive value of that product to keep their bodies warm, to develop parts of their bodies that we don't eat. Uh, and uh, so maybe we get back 10% of the food value of the soy we grow. And if we ate it directly, we wouldn't need to grow as much of it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's another great stat too, where it's like, it's like the 
calorie density or the, you know, how many calories per CO2 emitted. And it's like roughly, you know, cows are a hundred X worse than veggies and uh, dairy and, and chickens are 10 X worse. And so it's just like, yeah, it's so much worse to be chopping down the rainforest and um, having all these cows put uh, methane into the air um, instead of eating veggies. So let's, so let's talk about impact then. How do we, what do you see in, in maybe in the last 50 years and then going forward in these next 20 years, do you see, you know, you know, that graph is going up and to the right of how many factory farmed land animals per year and both on the animal um, welfare side, but also on the climate side. How do you see us getting, you know, there's this goal of getting to net zero from a climate perspective. What do you see as the goal for the animal kind of rights movement in the next, I don't know, you know, 30 or 100 years? And and how, how do you see, what are the good ways that we're actually going to be able to get there? Um, yeah. Well, the goal has to be, um, at a minimum, eliminating the industrialized production of animals, essentially factory farming. Um, that should not be here, certainly not in a century, but I think we could get rid of it a lot earlier, even maybe over 20 years. Um, but how do we do that is the question. Well, um, trying to convince people that this is what they ought to eat is one method, and it does work. It doesn't work with everyone is the problem. It works with a percentage of people. And I've actually been involved in studies showing that uh, giving philosophy students a uh, class in the ethics of eating meat does impact their diet. Um, you know, this was a, a randomized controlled study and uh, we could track what people were eating. So it, it influences some people, but it's not influencing enough or not. they're not making a big enough change. Um, so being vegetarian and vegan is still a minority. It's not the mainstream. And we have to somehow reach the mainstream. So how do we do that? Well, another strategy is to provide them with the kind of food that they want to eat at a price competitive with the meat coming from animals that does not come from animals. And there are two possible ways of doing that. The one that's already here and we're familiar with is producing products like the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Meat Burger, which are plant-based, but um, very similar to um, meat-based burgers. And they've had some success, but um, after an initial boom, they seem to have settled down a bit. Um, I think one issue might be price. They need to come down in price to uh, be really competitive with uh, burgers from animals. The other possibility is uh, growing animal cells um, essentially in a bioreactor and producing what is real meat with, with real animal cells, but not from an animal. Uh, that can be done. Um, uh, cellular chicken is on sale at a restaurant in Singapore now. It's, um, it's not cheap, which is why it's being sold at a restaurant where the price of the ingredients is only a small part of the price of the meal. Um, but it may come down in price and it does hold the hope if it does come down in price that it could replace um, a lot of meat products with, you know, clearly it'll replace hamburger before it replaces prime steak. Um, but eventually that may come. Uh, and actually there was an interesting development quite recently. So it's too recent for the book um, in the dairy, in, in producing dairy protein from a company in Israel that has received approval from the Israeli food authorities to sell um, dairy products produced by fermenting yeasts on particular animal cells and, and multiplying them, dairy cells. Uh, and the uh, food authority says it's nutritionally identical with um, milk from cows, but no cows are involved, so no greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, in principle, I think the price could be brought down to um, lower than that of milk from cows, in which case this could really be quite revolutionary. It, it could maybe in a decade or two do to the dairy industry what uh, digital cameras did to the film camera industry. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, I, and I do think that there's a... It's funny because yeah, we just live in this reality where you know price is so much the um, the, the what what determines people's behavior, and so I think having a and it makes me think too about one side is like the 
um, lowering the price of cellular meats or these kind of plant-based meats or whatever they might be. Um, and there is some exciting stuff there. And then I also think about kind of green premium things like a Bill Gatesism around like what the difference between like the solar cost, the cost of solar versus the cost of you know fossil fuels. And we've gotten solar down and down and down. And so, and it, I just think about other ways to kind of tax that system i guess are you in favor of any like should we like tax meat or whatever like i kind of feel like yes, yes. why not uh, uh, yeah I mean, I, I, yeah I, I wrote an op-ed for uh, the new york daily news on that maybe at least 10 years ago quite a long time ago um and of course got a lot of abusive emails um but uh you know that's okay um i think the idea is starting to gain more adherence i mean you know a lot of a lot of countries have uh Either cap and trade schemes for carbon or uh, or carbon taxes, uh, and if you're going to do that for carbon, then why not do it for the greenhouse gases emitted by by meat? Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, so it's it's essentially trying to price in the externalities that um, are left out between the producer and the consumer. And any uh, honest economist will admit that. Uh, externalities are a flaw in the market system and you need to try to make to internalize those external costs otherwise you're imposing costs on third parties who have no say in uh, the production or consumption of the product uh, and that's just wrong so yeah i would certainly favor meat taxes uh, to meat be taxes. used to help those people who are the victims of climate change of which unfortunately we're seeing more and more and they're often in the poorest countries of the world yeah, I agree. It's kind of it's like, yeah, you know, tax, tax, tax the meat, you know, pu pour that money at the hundreds of millions of climate refugees and stuff like that. So I think that would be uh, if we had a, a more well orchestrated society that might be better. I, I want to transition to um, this kind of some more philosophical questions with you here, which are, um, you know, you are a philosopher. So why not? We could do a little philosophy in addition to, you know, talking about the, the, the you know, cellular meat or um, cellular dairy and, and laws. So, so ph philosophically speaking, um, how do you think about, you know, there's this concept of moral patienthood, which is, um, you know, I have a brain, you have a brain, the little chicken has a brain, insects have a brain. Um, how do you, and like, which, how do we determine which ones are more or less important is, you know, is a hundred dolphins more or less important than a thousand humans or whatever? You know, so how do you think about moral patienthood and which things does deserve more moral weight? So firstly, I think the, the minimum criterion is the capacity to feel pain or pleasure. We use the term sentience sometimes to mean that. You, you have to be a being who is having conscious experiences um, which could be positive or negative for you. Uh, and then there's a question as to where we draw that line. Um, I suggested in the original Animal Liberation 1975, I said somewhere between a shrimp and an oyster seems a good place to draw the line. In other words, I don't think oysters are sentient beings. I don't know that shrimps are, but I think it's possible that they are. So I would give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and I came back to look at that for the for animal liberation now. And I found that it has stood up pretty well. There's a lot more research into sentience and a lot more discussion about sentience in invertebrates. And I'm sure that some invertebrates are sentient. I mean, you can't really, uh, you can't understand the behavior of an octopus without assuming that there's a conscious mind directing that behavior. Uh, so I'm sure that invertebrates can be sentient, but um, exactly which ones, whether it applies to shrimps, I don't know, but I think it doesn't apply to an octopus. The octopus is, doesn't have a sufficiently complex or centralized nervous system, doesn't have an evolutionary reason for developing pain because it couldn't really move away from the pain anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, somewhere around there. When you say octopus there, do you mean octopus? Or do you mean uh, Oh, sorry, I meant oyster there. Sorry. Oyster, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry. Like, well, octopus, thanks. we love octopuses. So, you know, octopuses sorry, are sorry. extra smart. You know? And of course they can move very fast, actually. <laughs> yeah, sorry, no. um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did mean oyster. Um, yeah, no. Thank Too you. Too many animals that start with O, o you know? Thanks for, um, pick, <laughs> thanks for picking that up. Yeah, no, uh, you're good. So shrimp, so shrimp are yeah, shrimp, so shrimp between are above a shrimp, the line. shrimp and Oysters. an oyster is where I yeah. think you might draw the line. Yeah, okay, great. That's right. What do you think? What do you think about another philosophical? What do you think about um, wild animal suffering? That there's, 
you know, not there's all these animals in factory farms, 700 billion land animals, 700, uh, sorry, 770 billion land animals, 700 billion um, fish every year. But then there's all these animals out there in the wild. You know, this is in the trillions. Um, should we care about them as well? You know, do you care about all animals now, Peter? What's going on? Well, I you know? care about them, but whether I can usefully do anything to improve their lives is a different question from whether I care about them. So, yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, fish are a good example. I think you, you gave a figure of 700 billion, which is including wild fish because the number of fish we rear in factory farms um, is, I saw a recent estimate and I quote in the book, uh, 124 billion. So that's still a vast number of fish, actually, even more than the chickens. But, um, but the 700 billion, which I think was an estimate that um, is the lower range of that estimate, and it actually goes over a trillion at the upper range, um, uh, they are wild animals. And one thing that we can do to avoid inflicting suffering on wild animals is is not to eat fish, um, because uh, you know that's a vast number. There's no humane slaughter for fish. And incidentally, don't think, oh, well, okay, I'll go and buy factory farm fish. Because if you buy a factory farm salmon, that's a carnivorous fish. And to feed that fish, about 147 fish have been killed to produce one salmon, um, which has grown to, let's say, you know, seven pounds or something like that. Uh, so uh, fishing is, an, uh, I think, an abominable industry as far as uh, its harm inflicts on wild animals is concerned. There are other things we can do quite easily. So um, if you have a cat, don't let your cat outdoors at night because almost all cats, even if you think yours is so cute and kind, would never hurt a fly. Actually, it would hurt not only flies, but um, small birds, um, small rodents, uh, so yeah, keep your cat indoors if you have a cat. Um, do birds fly into your windows? Uh, you can get uh, bird-friendly glass, which birds can see better than other glass. Uh, there's a whole range of things to do. But but you know what I am not advocating is that we say, oh, um, the lion is hurting the the antelope or the zebra here, so we need to get rid of the lions. Um, I don't want to do that. Um, I, yes, there is some suffering, but uh, I think interfering in those systems is likely to mean that the the prey animals uh, overgraze the uh, environment with with worse results, both for them and for the environment. So those are much more complicated questions, and there are issues of values, of course, about preserving ecosystems, which are complex. So I think there's there's lots of um, pretty simple steps that we can take. Um, uh, without thinking about some of the, the more controversial um, and incendiary ideas that would divide the animal movement from the environmental movement, which uh, yeah. would be a great shame. Yeah, dig it. Yeah, so it's, yeah, there's a, um, th all those wild animals doing their predator prey dynamics. Let's not touch those. There's so many more things uh, close to home that we can, we can yeah, do now. Yeah, so many worse things that we're doing oh, yeah. ourselves. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so what do you think about, um, in your book, you talk a lot about speciesism and how, you know, we started, oh, humans are the best, blah, blah, blah. We should care about animals too. Um, but now we have this new kind of possible intelligence. I'm not sure if it can feel pain or not. Um, but what do you think about um, AI and do we have any moral obligation to, to AI? I don't think there's any AI yet, which we have a moral obligation to, because I don't think there's any AI that is conscious or can feel pain or has hopes and wishes for the future, um, all things that are relevant in, in different ways uh, to how we should treat different beings. But as I say, the capacity for consciousness and feeling pain is uh, the minimum. Uh, you know, some people t talking to ChatGPT have had the idea that maybe this is conscious because ChatGPT mimics the way we talk or the way um, literature has us talking. Uh, you know, ChatGPT has read billions of pages of written text and is good at sort of responding in ways that uh, people respond in those texts. But uh, I don't think that is any reason for thinking that ChatGPT is a conscious agent. Um, but we could get there one day. I have no idea how long it will take. Um, maybe a decade or two, maybe 50 or 70 years. 
I don't know. But but in principle, there's no reason why if you can have consciousness coming out of this sort of biological carbon-based matter that is inside my skull, um, there's no reason why you couldn't have consciousness developing out of silicon chips. Um, it's just that uh, we haven't done it yet. Maybe we don't really understand how to do it or what might lead that to occur. But if we did once have clear evidence that, uh, or even, I guess, not so clear, but, you know, had a serious doubt about are we dealing with a conscious being, then I would say we should give that being the benefit of the doubt, as I would give the shrimp the benefit of the doubt, um, uh, and treat that being with respect and see what that being wants and uh, try to try to give that being that insofar as it doesn't interfere with other things that other sentient beings want. So, yeah, in, in principle, I could join a, a robot's rights movement just as I could join an animal rights movement. I love that. Yeah, maybe in 10 years we'll have, you'll write uh, AI liberation, you know, and it'll be uh, about uh, the robot rights movement. Um, so I want to ask a, a final kind of um, set of questions here about overrated and underrated. Um, and so I'll kind of say, ask you whether a thing is overrated or underrated. And then you'll kind of give, you know, a, a, a one sentence explanation on why. And I, these are all difficult. So, so you know, you'll do your best. Um, but do you think that the, um, do you think that being vegetarian, is that overrated or underrated? Well, I think it's still underrated. I think it's a great way to live. Um, and it's better for the environment and animals than um, being an omnivore. So, yeah, I'd like to see more people rate it more highly. Yeah, dig it. Okay, sweet. Um, what about cage-free eggs? Are those overrated or underrated? Uh, again, I, I think they're underrated in the sense that people still sell eggs from caged hens. Now, that's not to say that just the label cage-free is enough. Uh, I would only consider eggs to be ethical if they came from hens who really had a good life, could range outside and pasture. Um, then maybe you could justify eating them. But that's not cage-free, that's free-range, because many cage-free hens are still just very crowded inside sheds, thousands of birds in a shed. Uh, better than caged hen eggs, but not good enough. Yeah, okay, dig it. Um, what about effective altruism? Is that overrated or underrated? Uh, effective altruism, unfortunately, is still very much underrated. Um, it's, you know, America gives a lot of money to uh, charity, something like $500 billion a year. Um, and the percentage of that that goes to effective charity, uh, I'm guessing, but looking at the amount that goes to overseas causes and looking at some of the other things that some of it goes to, I would bet that 95% of that $500 million is not donated to the most effective charity. So, uh, yeah. Effective altruism is very much underrated and people need to go online and look at the most, find the most effective charities uh, to give to rather than giving much more randomly or impulsively. Yeah, I dig that. Yeah, I think I, I heard a stat of the 500 billion, it's like 0.1% is given to these effective charities. And so and if for listeners, if you there's all the animal liberation stuff, but then there's also if you, you could check out uh, The Life You Can Save, which is Peter's um, another kind of book about and ideas around global poverty, which is thinking about, yeah, not only should we care about the shrimp, um, but we should care about the uh, many people in extreme poverty. Um, well, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. If folks want to check out Peter online, a, he's on Twitter at at Peter Singer. That's at P-E-T-E-R-S-I-N-G-E-R. -E -E you can also check out the book. Um, Google just, you know, Animal Liberation Now. It's available anywhere. And it's just a really good overview and a reminder. And I think we kind of heard it today of just like, it's, it's, it's good to kind of be in touch with and empathize with um, the down, the actions, you know, the, the, impl the, the impact of your actions, you know, and like all these stories that you told today about these conditions that everybody's in. So, so check out the book to understand more about if you're eating meat now or if you're not, like what actual impacts it's having in the world. Um, and then also, not sure exactly when this will be uh, produced, but Peter's going to go on a speaking tour um, end of May, beginning of June. If you kind of Google uh, Think Inc., um, that's T H I N K. I and C um, and to Google that and Peter Singer, you can see that he's doing a speaking tour in the United States and also back in um, Australia. And, in, that, and Peter, in London, by the way. And in London, and yeah. in London. Um, 
Anything else that you want to say to our listeners today, by the way? Uh, it's been great talking to you. Um, if they want to get that book, you mentioned The Life You Can Save, you can get it free. I've uh, donated the, the, the rights, have gone to uh, the organization, The Life You Can Save. So you go to thelifeyoucansave.org and you can download it either as a digital book or an audio book. Um, so do that. And uh, please do pick up Animal Liberation now. Um, I'd really like to see that revive the movement and have a big impact and bring millions more people into opposition to some of the things we've been talking about. Yeah, love it. It's kind of like net zero for animals. It's like, let's make it happen. Thanks so much for listening today. If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, and see you here for the next episode. Bye.